Welcome back to the very last brief in OpenGovCon. So um, excited to announce my friend here, Russ, and uh, this is a, a definitely an interesting one. It's taking a look at how to approach container hardening at the DOD slash federal scale. So Russ, please take it away. Yeah, Kyle, thanks very much for putting GovCon together. Um, very much appreciated and, and onwards and upwards. Yes, so um, this talk is going to be a little bit more broad based. Uh, I've got, yes sir. Yes, of course. Can you not hear me? Yeah, I'll stand over here and then you can hear me. How's that? <laughs> no problem. Um, I've got a lot of feedback uh, during the week and um, the, the presentation today is going to um, give us a macro view of why you'd want to con harden containers and juxtapose that on um, a couple of the, the, the value propositions and, and the things that you need to be thinking about as you start to interact with federal marketplaces. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll chat a little about the various channels uh, going to the federal marketplace, how container hardening is a, a central role in that, uh, and then we'll introduce uh, some of the, 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 the partners and, 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 and the opportunities, and uh, it's the last session, uh, so we'll keep it relatively interactive. Um, I'm not gonna give you a, a very deep tech dive, but I do have leaflets, and I'm available after the after the talk and, and, and happy, to, happy to take that further. So, um, essentially, uh, what we're gonna talk about, um, well, I'm from Rapid Fort. Um, we are engaged with the federal government um, in, in, in quite, a, quite a meaningful way. And when you get engaged with the federal government, you need to do or solve a couple of challenges. You need to solve the technology onboarding challenge, which is a, a, a significant challenge, and we're gonna talk about that and the options for that. The contracting uh, vehicle challenge, and then sales and marketing. E essentially, the things that we take in the enterprise space for granted, those have parallels in the, in the federal space, and you need to be cognizant of, of, of that. And so you have entities that can, that can, that can help with this. Um, I would argue that Platform One and their ecosystem is a very viable channel. It's one of them. We're gonna discuss the pros and cons of other. And the SIPA program, which essentially is much like an enterprise paid POC, is, is essentially a, a, a vehicle to solve the second problem, which is contract vehicle onboarding. And then there are a number of emerging marketplaces to be aware of and, and all, of, all of that stuff. So this is essentially how to sell stuff to the government, sort of 101. Okay, so there are a number of, number of, um, there are a number of uh, potential partners or p potential channels. There's FedRAMP, StateRAMP. Uh, FedRAMP typically is for large uh, enterprises. It's, a, it, it's an expensive process. Uh, StateRAMP is FedRAMP's little brother. Um, a lot of the, the rules apply. Neither of these agencies are Kubernetes or open source friendly or agile technology friendly. And that's one of the big advantages that some of the other channels have. There are independent onboarding vendors. Um, uh, 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 for example, there's, uh, there's uh, subcontracting to a prime. That's another way that uh, smaller companies can engage in the federal space. And there are mark, uh, emerging marketplaces like Tradewinds, Adv Advanta, JFAC, and all of that stuff. But my um, argument would be that Platform One and the SIBA process is a really good place to, to go. Um, and we work with essentially all these companies and we understand all of these channels and I'm happy to broker uh, introductions to, to any, of you, or any of you guys here. Um, fundamentally, uh, how does this talk intersect uh, with vulnerability remediation and container hardening? I'll ex explain that intersection, but whether it's FedRAMP, StateRAMP or any of these other um, uh, channels, you have to harden containers, you have to uh, remediate and remove vulnerabilities, and that's why um, a company like us actually gets involved in, in, in all the, these federal intersections. Okay, so who here has heard of the SIBA process? You must, yes, I got three. Okay, <laughs> the SIBA process is essentially the equivalent of a paid enterprise POC, and they've structured it 
uh, in a similar process. So in the same way as when you engage with a large enterprise customer, you have a, a, a proof of concept that, has, that can either be paid or unpaid, success criteria and so forth, um, that um, is mirrored in, in the, the, the Department of Defense uh, where you have essentially a mechanism which, by, way, by which you are paid to actually go through the process of validating your technology. Phase one would uh, require you to build a prototype. Phase two, there needs to be some implementation. And then phase three would enable you to have a commercial relationship. So the civil process is actually a fast track into contracting ability because once you have a phase three, you are then essentially have your sales license that enables you to sell into these, um, these, these various opportunities. So in terms of solving problem number two, which is contracting vehicle, this is um, something that's important to bear in mind. Um, and they have a, a, a number of metrics by which they measure companies. Um, there's three opportunities a year to present. Um, you must be a US citizen to deliver services and it must be R&D. So what does that actually mean? Um, it means there must be experimentation, there must be risk, and there must be evidence of failure, believe it or not. Um, and so things like training, uh, things from like licensing and things like that are, are, are not necessarily in, uh, included under the program. And then it requires a customer memorandum where you have a technical point of contact uh, who's essentially like a project manager for a, a, a traditional POC. And this mechanism is, is incredibly valuable. And I, I was asked the, the question the other day, how important is the CIBA process to our, uh, to our engagement? It's very important. And in fact, most companies that interact initially with the Air Force come through this channel. So highly recommend it, but there are some things to be aware of. Um, it's a competitive process. Um, you need to uh, make uh, very thorough submissions and, and, and all of those things. But, uh, bear that in mind. So, a bit of technical stuff. I'll breeze through this very quickly. Um, Rapid Fort, the company I'm with, um, essentially is a DevSecOps tool which hardens software containers. Um, many of you were at the last talk. The way we do this is we essentially instrument the container. As it runs, we learn uh, its essentially its production, uh, its runtime profile, and then we harden it. And the reason this is beneficial to uh, customers wanting to enter the federal space is the number of vulnerabilities you have is going to be linearly related with cost. And so the less vulnerabilities you have actually entering the process, uh, the cheaper it will be. And we, we get good results. Uh, these, are, these are some results that we, we, we get with federal customers. Typically, the, these, are, these are very standard. Programming language dependent, Java 50 to 60%. Reduction sort of no JS would be sort of north of nine. All right. So how do you inter so we've talked about how you can get money, we've talked about how you can establish a contracting vehicle, and now we want to talk about the technical onboarding component, which is the third problem you're going to face. And I would argue that that platform one is a very good place to go. It's a good place to go because there's going to be technical alignment in terms of what you're doing. Um, the, the other channels uh, require you to certify your whole stack, 100% of it. So if you are essentially running um, in AWS, you, you will have to certify the entire uh, instance, whereas if you go through this channel, you only ne really need to certify the application layer, and you can inherit a lot, of the, um, a lot of the authorizations and the compliance benefits from, from the bottom. So, um, the, pro perhaps the, the, the best place to start is they have monthly I AMAs. Uh, Unbank has um, weekly um, discussions. There's some good documentation. You're welcome to take a photo of this. And then in terms of the, the CIBA process, I'm happy to broker introductions as well. However, okay, so Ironbank. Um, this channel has essentially three components. Um, it has a container repository, it has essentially a um, deployment mechanism, and then it has essentially ways to uh, support and deploy the, the container. So what IronBank is, is essentially a, a repository 
of uh, approved containers. And in order for you to start getting into the application layer, you need to get your containers through the Iron Bank process. Um, there's good literature online. Um, I did talk about um, th that in a previous talk. If you're interested in the minutiae of that, um, please let me know. And the Iron Bank process is very aligned with what's happening at the um, Open Source Security Foundation and all of these things. And if you, if you go to these links, you're going to get some, some, some really interesting information. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Big Bang is essentially the deployment um, platform that uh, you want to deploy in because that enables you to inherit all the controls and all the benefits of the, the, the previous work done. And it's open source and it's free. Um, and so Big Bang is uh, essentially, think of it as a, um, a Kubernetes, um, a hardened Kubernetes um, cluster. It's got STO, it's got logging, it's got everything you need in order to become compliant. And so this is gonna save you a lot of time, effort, and money if you go through FedRAMP, you're looking at a significant amount of pain just replicating this, and this is available for free um, online and, and, and away you can go. Any questions so far? Nothing from you? <laughs> okay. And then Party Bus. So we are blessed to have um, the, one of the managers of Party Bus. Um, here today, and uh, he, he, he'll be taking questions at the end. But what Party Bus does is Party Bus is essentially a, think of it as a, a professional services arm, if you will, that enables um, uh, federal customers to utilize these tools. So they stand up uh, DevOps pipelines, they do consulting engagements and, and, and things like that. Um, and that, that's essentially um, what they do. They, there's a lot more to it, and, and, and Steve can provide that, but essentially they are, they are the third component required in order for you to, to sort of leverage, leverage this channel. Okay, so we have gone through this journey um, uh, successfully. Um, we've learned a lot along the way, and uh, there's a few things that you should bear in mind uh, the other talk that I, I did previously talked about some of the challenges, but uh, essentially, as you go through the journey, you want to set up the deployment infrastructure, you want to harden the containers, you want to test it, and then you want to go through the certification process. And so uh, here, uh, it's, please feel free to take a photo of, of, of the slides, is essentially your uh, template for an engagement with, with, with Iron Bank. And there are groups available, uh, Defense Unicorns and a couple of the other groups uh, that can facilitate, can, can facilitate this journey. All righty. Okay, so I've breezed through my talk. Um, is, does anyone have any, have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I have my perspective, but um, I'll pass it over to, to, to Camden to take that one. Yep, so, uh, so I'll repeat the question there. So the question was, if Platform 1 moves over to JWCC, uh, how might that impact the, the server process? So, um, so to date, the, the, the planning and work that has gone into us moving over to JWCC is... Uh, is one comment that Ms. Knausenberger made in public. Um, so, so certainly we are not currently moving to JWCC, you know, like that is there's an idea that's floating out in the space. Um, that being said, if we did go over there, so um, the server process is a DOD process, the Small Business Innovation Research process. Um, AFWorks and SpaceWorks run that for the Air Force, with the Air Force side of that. Um, kind of, we could build a whole other set of slides uh, for each of the services in terms of how they manage that because every service has their own way of doing it. Um, so it, it would still exist. It might look a little bit different. Uh, most likely, 
if we did move into some sort of a joint construct, I would imagine they would leave it with the Air Force to to still do cibers related to that because there's no joint cyber office really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th th thank you. Uh, my per perspective is the cyber process uh, for the Air Force is going extremely well, and the other um, the other um, uh, the other components of the armed forces are following suit. So one of the things that makes the Air Force uh, unique is they have what's known as an open topic at both the Navy and the Army and so forth are following suit. And so the, the cyber process is working extremely well in the Air Force. Um, it has its challenges elsewhere. So I, I would hope that the leadership doesn't break what's already working. <laughs> and um, that could be an opportunity for the, for, 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 for the, the, the other um, cyber programs to sort of fall in line with, with the, essentially the, the leader in the space. So I don't, I don't see, think it's going anywhere. Any other questions? You've got a question in you, I can tell. <laughs> That's a great question, and then I'll answer a reciprocal question, which is how, how can open source projects go through the server process? So, um, at each of the stages, there's very different valuation metrics. And so at phase one, what they're really looking for is exposure to a wide variety of ideas and technologies. And so small companies, uh, one or two pe people um, in a garage with a semblance of a product would have an opportunity to participate. And so what they're really screening for is innovation. At phase two, they change and they start looking for commercialization. And so what's looked for at, for phase two companies is essentially investment, um, commercial traction, size of team, um, customer base, all of these kinds of things. And so uh, one of the um, things about the CIBA process is there doesn't seem to be middle ground between phases one and phase two. And what we're starting to see is a blending, and so there's bigger phase ones coming in with slightly more stringent requirements that are meeting that need. And then phase three is essentially a commercially uh, ready product, and th that sort of to do that you need to meet um, essentially the qu the qualities of enterprise sales. So you need to have um, uh, 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 customer support, you need to have financial sustainability, and so forth. And so as you go down the path, um, it gets harder. So one of the challenges for open source projects going into the civil process is they don't have a lot of the things. They're not incorporated, which is a, a, a fundamental problem. Um, there isn't um, oversight in terms of who can contribute. So this, these programs are designed for US citizens. And if you have other um, contributors, that, that can create problems. And so the civil process is not necessarily uh, well adapted to a true open source project. <coughs> Where there is an opportunity is to add services, components on top of a, an open source project, and there's been a number of successful use cases that have done that. So if you are involved in an open source project, you are interested in the, the, the CIBA uh, journey, incorporate, um, go through that, that process, and then that will enable you to get, to, to get funding and, and to, to take your, um, your concept further. Yes. As soon as we hit 501 people, you are no longer eligible to compete in this program, and you have to go start a new company. Mm -hmm. Yep. But 500 employees is a lot. I mean, your average security company has got less than a, a, a hundred. But yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's it's worth investigating. Um, one of the the great aspects of this is it's a it's it, it's an interesting way to actually have dialogue with with sophisticated customers. Um, you will meet uh, and get very interesting feedback and divergent viewpoints. Hey, Russ, I have a question. Okay. So, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the failures that come with, you know, enacting a small business innovation research effort, and Rapid Choice has done this, which has been great. We actually heard a little bit about that the other day with your, uh, your talk with Shannon from, uh, from Google. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, if you're venture backed, um, the venture capital community doesn't understand SBIRs, and they are going to treat this contract just like an enterprise customer contract. So, there are going to be pipeline reviews. There's going to be a lot of scrutiny around it, and. The, the, the ability to sequence and meet deliverables and things like that is largely determined or somewhat determined by the, the speed at which your TPOC can process things. And so there can be the misperception that this relationship has stalled uh, and, and, and so forth, and concern around that. Because uh, in the enterprise world, if you're not succeeding in a customer, you're failing. And that is a a, a, a bad mark. Venture investors are very sensitive to signs of failure. They're trying to work out, do they have a product? Is it going to be sticky? Is it solving a significant problem? And when they see that there's a lack of um, momentum, that, that can cause concern. And so the, the key there is education um, in terms of uh, telling your investors, this is the process, this is the way it works. It, it, it may become slow and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and all of that. But then, then there's also the opportunity to talk about the other phases in terms of sequentially, if we deliver, uh, there's an opportunity for us to, 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 to address a, a large audience. So it's, it's one of mis, miscommunication is how I'd say. Um, for example, um, in the finance world, um, if you're not collecting invoices, they start becoming aged. And then the auditors are saying, is this a real an account? There's revenue recognition issues. Um, there's all sorts of unintended consequences when you uh, look at a cyber based contract like an enterprise-based contract. But all of them can be avoided um, largely through communication and then having an enthusiastic TPOC who's, who, who's pushing you through uh, the journey and supporting you. So what does the future look for us? Like, uh, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think uh, when we first started Rapid Fort three years ago, vulnerability remediation, the only people who were doing vulnerability remediation was the Department of Defense. Um, and so when we would talk to big financial services companies and so forth, it was a tier two, tier three problem. Now it's bumped up the, um, the uh, es essentially the importance on the list of CISOs very significantly. And what's driving that is a lot of the compliance and the regulation. And the indication that liability can shift towards software manufacturers for not patching vulnerabilities. And so our company, and in fact the industry, has seen a real um, uh, tailwind in terms of where we're going with, with, with vulnerability remediation. Does it? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh -huh. So, do you know who the number one contributor to Kubernetes is? No, actually. It's Alibaba. So, interesting stat. So, um, there are um, open source projects that don't have good governance structures, and there's open source projects that do. And um, there's a strong tendency uh, with, within um, the federal space to go through and utilize uh, projects that have strict governance, have eyes on multiple checks, comply with all these frameworks and things like that. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, and Camden can correct me here, uh, the CNCF sort of stamp of approval is the, t the level of comfort you've got to get to in order to be uh, entertained by, by um, uh, sort of federal agencies and certainly DOD agencies. So can you shed any light on where the, the, the threshold might be? Yeah, so, so things like the CNCF stamp of approval definitely help. Um, 
so we're well aware that, that we have products in Iron Bank today that that have a, a preponderance of, of foreign ownership or foreign contributions. Um, I'm trying to think, I want to be careful what I say here. So that being said, so it really goes back to those governance structures, like, like Russ was saying. So our model is in Iron Bank, um, it's largely modeled after the OpenSSF scorecard. Um, so it's, we try not to be about who you are as much as do you have a process and do you follow it? Are you, you know, do you actually have signed commits enabled? Do you actually have review going on before things get merged? Um, one of our big pushes over the last few years in, in software is to go from personality-based decisions to making decisions based on more objective criteria. And so um, that being said, you know, if you're looking to do business with the federal government, you know, the, so the U.S. government, um, being a, a U.S. company and having those those kinds of fire firewalls that we would historically expect for folks doing business with the U.S. government is is certainly helpful. But but we definitely recognize that software in general and open source software in specific uh, is an international endeavor. Thank you. Good question. Appreciated it. Do we have any other questions? Well, I, I certainly hope this discussion was was interesting. Um, there's a lot of painfully learned lessons in here, um, things that I wish I'd, I knew, and I'd encourage you to reach out to me. I'd love to help you um, on your journey. Uh, it's something that, that uh, my company is very passionate about in terms of open source and its intersection with, with, with the, federal, the federal marketplace. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Great. Well, thanks everybody. That was our first um, open GovCon. And so stay tuned for more. Um, we plan to make this a series of events. We appreciate all the support for this first go and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Can we get a round of applause for Kyle? Yeah, Kyle. Well said. <laughs>